A very good day to you and welcome to the program. I want to speak to you today about writing in the sand. But before we do, let us go to the Word of God. The book of James, the epistle of James, chapter 1, and I'm going to read from verse 19. And this is what the Word says. So then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath, to anger. For the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. I really want to say to you that anything spoken in anger is not from God. Now, I'm not talking about righteous anger, because remember, Jesus got angry in the temple when he saw the Pharisees using his father's house as a money-changing uh, business. He took his time and he made a whip and he went in and he cleared out that temple. There is such a thing as righteous anger. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about losing your temper and saying it's the Lord. It's not the Lord. Okay, there's too much of that at the moment. I've got my rights. If you are a child of God, you don't have any rights. Paul said in Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. The life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave his life for me. So when we become God's children, we don't have any more rights. We have died to self. So we can't just lose our temper and throw our toys. That's what I'm talking about. And by the way, this message is not only for you. It's also for me. I get convicted continually. We cannot lose our temper, stamp our feet, thump the table. We can't do that. Not as believers. We really need to produce fruits of the Spirit. Jesus was known to be a man who was slow to speak and very quick to listen. And as I'm getting older, I'm realizing you can't hear anything if you're talking. Why did God give you two ears and one mouth? Because he wanted you to listen twice as much as you speak. I think there's some truth in that one. Okay, so the wrath of man, the anger of man, does not produce the righteousness of God. It doesn't work like that. Okay? And that's why I have a problem. When people are getting aggressive, we're going to fight fire with fire. It doesn't work like that in the kingdom of God. An eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. That does not apply. Jesus says we must turn the other cheek. When somebody slaps you on the one side, you give him the other cheek. Go the extra mile. It's very tough. I can hear you saying that. Hey, but that's hard. It is hard. But it's the way God wants it. If we're going to implement an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, everybody's going to be walking around with one eye and no teeth. We really need to forgive and we need to love one another. If you look at the message translation for the same scripture, James chapter 1, verses 19 and 20, this is what the word says. Lead with your ears. Follow with your tongue and let anger straggle along at the rear. Isn't that good? I'll read that again. Lead with your ears. In other words, you must listen. Follow with your tongue. Only respond when you've heard the truth. Sometimes when a man's speaking to you, there's something behind it. It's not actually the issue that he's talking about. Okay? You know, I had a, a father and a son came to this office. And they, they had a problem, and maybe they're even watching this program. They had a problem with the future of the farm. The father had built the farm up from nothing. It was a wonderful farm. His young son was a very innovative, forward-going farmer, and he needed to take over. But his father wouldn't give him the reins. See? That was the argument. So I sat there and I was listening. Obviously, I've got the same situation. I've got sons, and I also started the farm, but I've moved along from there. They've now got the farms, and the title deeds, and the debt. 
<laughs> and I'm staying on their farm, <laughs> free of charge, and I'm not paying for the lights and water. No jokes aside. So there are, there's a bit of a power struggle going on here. But I was able to listen. See, God says you must listen. And they went back and forwards. And then I said to the father, now listen, if you don't hand over the farm to your son, he's going to leave. He's going to go somewhere else with his wife and his children. And you're going to sit there with that big farm. And it's just going to di disintegrate around your ears, literally. So the son's sitting there and he's smiling. And then I said to the son, your father owes you nothing. But to bring you up and educate you, that's all. Nothing else. Anything else he gives you is a bonus. It's a gift. He is not entitled to have to give you the farm. And then the father was smiling and the son wasn't very happy. But you know, with us going back and forwards and we're talking about this and talking about that, at the end of the day, you see, the truth came out. By the way, the son called for this meeting, not the father. Isn't that amazing? Then, right at the end, they got very emotional. And then the son started to cry. Now, he's a big, strong man, but he was crying from a very sore heart. And then his dad started crying. And you know what he said? It makes me want to cry telling you this story. He said, Dad, you never come and visit your grandchildren. Ooh. You see, what had happened was his mother had died and his dad had got remarried, which is quite right. He was a widow and he'd been widowed for a long time. Found a, a, maybe another lonely lady. And he was trying to build a new life, but at the, at the expense of not going to see his grandchildren. You never take my grandchildren around on the farm in the pickup. And then the old man didn't know what to say. Now, I'm also getting convicted because I've also got grandchildren. And I don't think I see them enough either because I'm always away. The issue was not the farm. The issue was a relationship between a father and a son. And man, I tell you what, they got up from that table and they went around and they just embraced each other and they wept on each other's shoulders. And I believe, I trust to believe that everything has been reconciled. So sometimes when you lead with your ears, see, then you hear what the real need is. It's not the issue at stake. It's something behind. And that's the same with the political situation. It's the same with the economic situation. It's not always what you think. And that's why the Lord says very clearly in verse 19, okay, be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger, to wrath. Okay, for the wrath, anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. So I want to encourage you with that. Do you remember what happened with Jesus? That's why I'm calling this program Writing in the Sand. The Pharisees arrived. They came with an ulterior motive. They wanted to try and catch out the Lord, you know. It wasn't about the woman at all. They wanted to catch him. Okay? If a woman was caught in adultery, she was to be stoned to death in the town square. This woman was actually caught in the act. It wasn't, a, you, you read the, the account. It wasn't a rumor. They actually caught her with another man. And so they brought her to Jesus. And what did Jesus say? He didn't say anything. That's right. Sometimes I want to say to some of the ladies here, when your husband comes home and um, you've got something to say to him and he's not too quick to answer, just give him a bit of a break. Give him a chance. He's tired. He's weary. He's been working all day. And uh, maybe he's got other things on his mind and you start to chirp and he just doesn't like it. And it does not help. Just leave it for a bit and bide your time and then speak about the issue. Otherwise, all you do, you just pour petrol on the fire and it just makes it twice as big. So Jesus just knelt down and he took his finger and everybody, including me, especially me, is just dying to hear when we get to heaven, Lord, what were you, <laughs> what were you writing in the sand? Because the Bible doesn't tell us. And he knelt down and he started to write in the sand. And then he looked up and he said to all these Pharisees, these self-righteous men, some of them were priests and they were in the church. And he said, because they all had rocks, they were ready to stone her. And she was standing by Jesus. And he looked around and he said, okay, those of you that have got no sin, you cast the first stone. Well, that was the end of it, wasn't it? Those big rocks, dropped them, walked off. And then he said to the woman, your sins are forgiven. Go and sin no more. 
And I want to just add that little bit on the end there, folks, and I want to say this to you. Many people will quote that whole story and say, ah, but Jesus just forgives. He does forgive, but he says, go and sin no more. There are some people who say, we've been saved, and you have, and so have I. Nobody knows that more than me. By grace, undeserved loving kindness. Therefore, the blood of Jesus has washed away all of my sins, and all the sins I'm going to commit, and all the sins, yes. But Jesus said to the woman, go and sin no more. Change your lifestyle. You can't go back and sleep with another man because you believe that I've forgiven you. We really need to understand that. And that's a false teaching. And I want to say to you, it carries no water. When you know better, premeditated sin is not to be forgiven. When you know you're going to do something wrong, but you do it on purpose because God's forgiven me. Lies. God forgives you when you come with a repentant heart. Lord, I'm so sorry. Like the prodigal son. I've sinned against heaven. I've sinned against you, Father. And then his dad came and embraced him and said, your sins are forgiven. We really need to understand that. Folks, we need to be so careful that we don't judge people out of a heart of anger. You know that old saying, sticks and stones will break my bones, but words will never harm me. Do you know that saying? That's right. We were taught that at school, weren't we? I see one of my cameramen nodding his head here because that's what we were taught. But it is a wrong teaching, totally wrong. In fact, it's actually the opposite. When you get beaten with a stick or a stone, your body can heal. But when somebody says something ugly and cutting to you, unless you've really had forgiveness and maybe deliverance, actually, in some cases, especially from a loved one, a mother, a father, a daughter, a son, you know, you remember that old saying, I remember when I was, was, when I was young, you get a mother, you little devils, you know, you're all smiling there, aren't you? But what are you saying? You're just, call, you, you're just pronouncing a, a curse on your children. You little devils, you never listen, eh? eh? Come on now. Mother, really, we can't do that. And I wish you'd die. You know how many times um, you've, heard, you've heard parents say that about their kids? You blame it absolutely exasperate me. I'm sick and tired of talking about it. I, I wish you'd just go away and die. You can't say that. What are you saying? You know, I heard one of the saddest stories. Uh, a lady who's asked since God to be with the Lord. And I must be honest, uh, um, she became a very good friend to Jill and I. Her daughter came all the way from England not so long ago to come and see us and show her us her little baby. She's now happily married the daughter. Now, the mother and the father had a bit of a rough deal. He, he, he was a very, very fine rugby player, but he had a terrible accident and it left him handicapped. And he started to drink and he had a drinking problem. And he'd come home at 2, 3 o'clock in the morning, absolutely plastered, and he'd literally collapse into bed. And his poor old wife had to lie next to him. And the one night, she was so angry with him. She said to him, I wish you'd just die. Anyway, she, he just passed out and she turned over on her side of the bed and went to sleep. When she woke up in the morning, there was no movement from his side of the bed and she shook him and he was dead. He'd actually died during the night and she was devastated because she loved him. And I remember her coming to us and saying, you know, I just wish I could tell him I didn't mean it. And that was when we were able to say, but you can tell Jesus and, and Jesus knows. And she did and eventually she got a release. Don't say something that you will regret. I often say to people, count to 10 before you say it, and then you probably won't say it. You know, I wish you, and then 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Ah, just leave it. You know, because it's not necessary. We must be so careful the way in which we speak to each other. Human anger is never a legitimate tool to promote God's righteous purpose. I'll read it again. Human anger is never a legitimate tool to promote God's righteous pur purpose. That is out of the Passion Translation. And that's so true. We must come with an opposite spirit. And that just finishes people. You know, when, when you do that, you know, I've told you this story before. And it's so true and it's so... It's so close to my heart, I'm going to tell it to you again. When I just started farming on this farm, and I was really struggling, and I was battling, 
I had enough money to put in one crop of seed maize. One crop. It was all in one block. Now, if you know anything about seed maize, you've got two types of maize. The one type you plant and you leave the flower in the top. And the other type you plant and you take the flower out before it sheds pollen so that the pollen from this variety will pollinate the cob, the mealy, from the other one. And that's where you get your hybrid vigor. And that's what the seed companies are trying to do. So they send these young inspectors that go through the fields every day. And if they see any of this variety of maize shedding a flower, shedding pollen, of course there's no cross-pollination. And if they get 1%, which is 1 in 100. Now we've got 40,000 plants per hectare, and I had about 100 hectares. I want to tell you folks, it is millions and millions of flowers. They have to be picked out every day. They don't all come out the same day. But then the wind blows, and of course they all come out. The inspectors come, and if they can see 1%, they will condemn your whole crop. Then you're going to take a gyro mower and cut the crop down. You can't sell the maize as commercial maize. Now, all the maize was in one block. So you can't just say, well, that field. No, it was one field. It was absolutely critical. I'll never forget it. It was 4 o'clock on an afternoon. It was hot. The sun had been blazing all day. And any of you know about maize plants, they're tall. And inside, you can hardly breathe because that, that plant respires. I had about 80 women. And we're walking up and down these lines all day. I was walking with them. And I was just a young man. And some of these were old ladies, eh? And they were tired. And they'd done a great job up and down, up and down. At about 10 minutes to 4, up comes a pickup. Out gets two young bucks. Nice, strong, fit guys. They've got a pair of running tackies on. And they've got their cattle counters. And they go straight into the maze. One on this side, one on that side. And they come out and they say, still too many plants there. We're going to come back tomorrow morning. And if those, pl those flowers are not pulled out, we, um, unfortunately, we're going to have to condemn the whole crop. I couldn't believe it. I said, but we've, we've just come through there. He said, yeah, it's probably the heat and the wind, but you need to take them out. I said, my people are exhausted, man. He said, Angus, I'm sorry. I'm just doing my job. Tomorrow morning, we'll be here at 7 o'clock. If those plants, uh, the flowers are not out of those plants, we're condemning the crop. That's my whole livelihood, the farm, everything. So off they drive. So all the women come out and they are tired. Eh? Now they're picking up their lunch boxes and they're going to start walking home. And I said, hey, whoa, 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 whoa. See? Now listen carefully now, see? Human anger is never a legitimate tool to promote God's righteous purpose. They all start walking up the road. I said, come back here. They look at me, they're exhausted. I said, come back here right now. You are going to go back into that field and we're going to take all those plants out. They looked at me, now they'd worked their, their task. They didn't have to. They looked at me and they said, no, we're not. Then I got angry. I was stamping my feet like a spoiled little boy. You will come back. Come back immediately. And they looked at me, they said, we're not coming back. We've done our task and we're leaving. They just kept walking. And then it was as if the Holy Spirit said to me, and now? What are you going to do now? And I realized I had nothing that I could do. As they were walking away, I could see my farm just leaving. Picking up Jill and the little kids and going to find a job somewhere. Then I stopped and I changed my attitude. And I said, please stop. And they looked at, they heard my voice, they turned around. I said, I just want to ask you to please help me. I am so sorry. This is not my own doing. It's the weather. These inspectors are coming back tomorrow morning. See, explain yourself. They're coming back tomorrow morning. And if those flowers are still in that field, they're going to fail us. I'm asking you to please help me. That's all I did. Humbled myself. You know what they did? Some of the old women turned around and said, come on, let's help him. I tell you, I think I started to cry. They came back, put their lunch boxes down sang a couple of good Zulu songs <laughs> and went in the field and they cleaned up that field. The next morning, the inspectors were there at 7 o'clock. They couldn't find any flowers. They said, Angus, well done. I want to say to you, we must come with an opposite spirit. This is not the time for you and I to start shouting 
our mouths off. I want to finish off with a little story. Somebody sent me a little clip. Maybe you've seen it on, on my cell phone a couple of months ago. It made me cry, actually. And this is how it goes. It looked like it was in some foreign country because there was no speaking. But a teacher, quite an awesome looking guy, walked into a classroom and all the children stood up. And obviously the beginning of the day, and then there was a knock on the door and this little boy came in. He was late. Teacher called him. He took a strap, a leather strap. The little boy had to put his hands out and he beat him on the strap, on the, on the hands with the strap. And the little boy started crying and he told him they're going to sit down. Next day, same thing. All the kids were in the class, knock on the door, in comes this little guy. Now he's, 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 he's cowed down now, he's waiting for it. Puts his hands out, gets a slap again. Goes crying, told to go and sit down. This happened for a few days in a row. Then the next scene is the school teacher is coming to work in the morning on his bicycle. As he rides up the road, he looks and he sees the same little boy who's always late coming out of his house, but he's not alone. He's pushing a wheelchair. And in the wheelchair is his, obviously his little brother who's handicapped, and he's taking his little brother to his school first and then running as fast as he could to get to his own school. And when he walks into the class, the teacher stands and he looks at him. And the little boy walks up and puts his hands out. The teacher just puts his arms around him, hugs him, Starts to weep. You see, folks, we must be careful we don't judge. We must work according to God's ways, not our ways. Because 90% 90 of the time we're wrong. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, I want to pray today that you'll give us gentle spirits. Lord, that we'll not act like the world who don't know any better. But Lord, we'll always see the other side of the story. There are always two sides to every story before we make a judgment, before we say anything. Lord, you said in your word, blessed are the peacemakers. Please, Lord, make us peacemakers. In Jesus' name, amen. May the Lord bless you and uh, keep you and make you an ambassador for him. And when a person gets angry with you and starts shouting, have a look at the situation from his viewpoint, and then you won't be so harsh to make a judgment. So until the next time, may God bless you. Goodbye. Thank you for watching today's message by Angus Bucket. We trust that you were blessed. For more information about Shalom Ministries or upcoming events, please visit angusbucket.co.za. Have you downloaded the free Uncle Angus mobile app yet? You can enjoy more messages like this as well as exclusive content direct to your device. See you next time. Goodbye.